Um, my, as you just heard, my name is Suzanne Smith, uh, and I will have the great pleasure of introducing our first tutorial speaker for today. Uh, so many of you may be quite familiar with Dr. Jim Birch, um, but for those of you who might only be slightly familiar or not really familiar, I'm just going to give you a little highlights of his career so far. Uh, Jim Birch, he earned his PhD from Rice University back in 1968, uh, followed by three years of service with the U.S. Army. Um, from 1971 to 1977, he spent time working at both NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center as well as Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and after those six years split between Greenbelt, Maryland and Huntsville, Alabama, Jim found his way back to Texas. For 42 years and counting, uh, Jim has worked for the Southwest Research Institute. Um, and for the past 34 years, he has held the position of Vice President of Space Science and Engineering. Uh, Jim has worked as the principal investigator of multiple instruments on ex Dynamics Explorer, Space Lab, and uh, Rosetta. And of course, being a uh, PI of an instrument is impressive enough, but Jim doubled down and made his way as a uh, principal investigator of two missions. One being the Image, Image Mimix mission and is currently the principal investigator of MMX, the mission uh, that was the reaching goal for the 1996-97 Sun-Earth Connection Roadmap. And I mention that because Jim may or may not have been the chair of that committee back in 96 and 97. Uh, with a career as full as I've just described, uh, Dr. Birch was bound to have some awards and honors, so I'm just going to list a couple of them. He's an HU fellow. He uh, received the honor of doing the HU Van Allen lecture, um, as well as the HU Fleming Medal. And just recently, Jim received uh, the Distinguished Alumnus uh, Honor by Rice University. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Jim, Dr. Jim Birch to the podium. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everybody. Coming is a real honor for me to talk about MMS and magnetic reconnection at this meeting. Get my stopwatch going. So, uh, primary objective of MMS to solve electron physics of magnetic reconnection in the boundary regions of the Earth's magnetosphere. So mainly magnetopause and magnetotail, but MMS does a lot more. Reconnection happens in a lot of uh, new and unexpected places. But in this talk, because of the time limit, I'll only be talking about electron diffusion region. So I won't be talking about ion physics of reconnection, turbulence, particle acceleration. All of these are very active uh, topics within the MMS team. So if that's OK, I'll talk about uh, what we've learned about magnetopause reconnection and tail reconnection, mainly the EDR that wave phenomena associated with reconnection in these places. The ubiquity of reconnection, refining reconnection in unpredicted places, which is always fun. And then talk about uh, prospects for the future. Now, reconnection's been around a while. Uh, we've known it's important for a while. And we know that uh, there are two different types of geometry. One is symmetric. Like they tell me to use the cursor instead of the pointer, but Flips my slide. That's not so good over here. Anyway, on the left is symmetric, where the plasma and field parameters in both inflow regions are the same. This is like in the magneto tail, a lot of times in the laboratory. But the magnetopause is different. That is where the, on the right is asymmetric convection, because on the magnetosphere side, the magnetic field is strong, particles are more energetic. Densities are lower. And so the effect that this has is what was predicted here by Paul Cassett, Mike Shea, in uh, 07, that the X line where the magnetic field lines uh, reconnect, and the stagnation point where the uh, solar wind and magnetic sheath electrons stop their flow 
the magnetic loss. But those are at the same point for symmetric on the left. For asymmetric, you can see they're shifted. The X there and the S. The X is shifted towards the uh, solar wind side and the S toward the magnetosphere side. So this was a nice prediction. That that's exactly what happens. And uh, so we'll that dice box there, I'm going to try this cursor again. Every time I hit that cursor, it changes my song. So there's a dice box, and that's the electron diffusion region. That's mainly, yeah, on the, on the left side is the blue box. Oops, let's see what's this. Yeah, that's the electron diffusion region. And there's also an ion diffusion region that surrounds it. And this one, this is the electron diffusion region. There's a bigger ion diffusion region. So the stagnation point, one over here too, and the uh, X line, both are within the electron diffusion region. Okay. Now, some of the things we see in, in our measurements that tell us we're near or within a reconnection uh, event happen in the ion diffusion region. So here on the left for symmetric reconnection, this uh, salmon colored box is the ion diffusion region. And uh, within that, you have currents that are flowing these dash lines. This is because in the ion diffusion region, the electrons and ions get decoupled. Ions get decoupled from the magnetic field. Electrons are still coupled to the magnetic field. And so these currents produce uh, magnetic fields, called in the Hall magnetic fields, quadrupolar magnetic fields. Interestingly enough, these were first, uh, well, these were predicted by Big Sarabuck in 79. They were observed first in the laboratory at MRX in Princeton and uh, not published for a while because I think they were puzzled by it and then they were seen by uh, Cluster as well. So this is not new to MNS, the Hall magnetic field, but also Hall electric field associated with these charge uh, imbalance between ions and electrons. It's these red arrows here. So you see the uh, electric fields coming in the normal direction into the reconnection site. These are Hall electric fields. A lot of times this is how we know we're close to reconnection region. Now on the right is the uh, asymmetric case, like on the magnetopause. And there it's the same, except for two differences. We have another normal electric field here. And that is caused by the <laughs> fact that the ions penetrate deeper into the magnetosphere than the electrons. So it's an antipolar field stronger than the Hall field, so you have to keep it uh, in mind when you're diagnosing this. The other thing is that these current loops, they're both still there, but the one on the uh, magnetosphere side is, is kind of compressed, and if it's asymmetric enough, it almost goes away, so you only have one quadrupolar magnetic field. So that there's this asymmetry in this, these current loops as well. This is the, uh, all of this is the ion diffusion region, so this is electron. Yeah, so we all know why we needed four spacecraft. One of the reasons, so you can measure the curl of quantities, like the magnetic field, you get the current, and uh, velocity, you get vorticity, electric field, you get uh, dBdt, all of these reasons why you like to have four, so you can compute curls. But uh, I think a, another important reason was you needed to find reconnection regions. So on the left, we show we have two spacecraft in the two inflow regions, two and two outflow regions, and it helps you detect the reconnection region. And then on the right shows the two diffusion regions, uh, turquoise one, the ions, red one, the electrons. Electron uh, skin depth is only uh, less than two kilometers, so it's impossible to put all four spacecraft in there at the same time. However, we do have a number of times when all four spacecraft go through the electron diffusion region, whereas the others are in the ion diffusion region as shown in this diagram. So we had a prime mission that ended in August 2017, and during that prime mission on the left you can see the uh, blue-green uh, circle there. This is in the XY plane, the magnetopause shown there on the left. Earth in the middle. So this turquoise green uh, circle there was phase one, where we had one A and one B. So we spent uh, a year, year and a half, skimming the dayside magnetopause in that phase with a 12 RE apogee. And then we raised the apogee, 25 RE, 
the tail phase. And so now we're, we did one tail scan, and that's shown on the right. We see the red. This is where we're close to the neutral sheet. And during the uh, one on the left, with the green and the magnetoplast skimming, we found uh, approximately 35 uh, EDRs, uh, reconnection events, most of which have been published. And on the night side, during that first tail scan, we found uh, either five or six that have uh, been published. And, but we have an extended mission, I'll talk about that at the end. So there was a prediction that was made by Michael Hesse in 2014, where you have a field reversal on the left and an electric field, and uh, in this case it would be the uh, uh, northward electric field. And when you look in the equatorial plane in the center panel, the electrons from the magnetosheath come in, mix with the magnetospheric electrons, when on the magnetosphere side, they circulate in one direction because of an earthward field. If the field is southward on the magnetosphere side, then they circulate in the opposite direction. You go from red to blue, and then they end up meandering. As they do this, you get an agyrotropic distribution, which shows magnetosphere electrons mixed in with magnetosphere electrons, forming these crescent distributions that uh, Michael published before we launched MMS. He never expected we would see these. In fact, one of the first things we saw. Now we went and we're looking for uh, dayside reconnection events. You see the simulation on the left done by Paul Cassett and the four MMS spacecraft moving northward. Magnetosphere is on the left, magnetosheath is on the right. The red is where you have uh, dissipation. You see it's earthward of the uh, X line in this case. Spacecraft aren't moving much. So this, uh, essentially, they're not moving at all. But it's a reconnection structure. And this is something we knew it was moving in and out. We didn't really think that much about it, moving north and south. The primary motion of the reconnection structure is north-south. Here, moving southward, so typically what we see, about 100 kilometers per second. <clears throat> at the same time, it's moving uh, radially in an oscillating manner at about 50 kilometers per second. And the other thing about reconnection is the reconnection X line coming out of the screen is very long, like Earth radii long. That wasn't the case. I don't think we ever would have found any of these. So we have this reconnection cycle moving. It's also very long in the direction where, generally, the direction where things don't change much. So now for this case, uh, the center panel comes from the same simulation. The dash blue line shows a trajectory of MMS. You see we're coming out at the bottom in the, ex in the uh, exhaust region, going out to the magnetosheath, solar wind, and then up uh, into the exhaust region. And uh, later, uh, two people, Hiroshi Asagawa and Richard uh, Denton, did a reconstruction for this event. Shown on the right, you see the four spacecraft didn't go through the X line at the equatorial plane. You see the tetrahedron there in white. They were going right through the uh, electron stagnation region where the dissipation is occurring for events like this. This is an event with no guide field. So we know now with no guide field, the X line is uh, around the X point is very quiescent. But then they all moved into the region of open field lines. Uh, as you can see right uh, well near the top of that figure. So this is, uh, well, a sketch with real data. This is uh, the uh, reconnection structure right here. The X line, the red is the stagnation region, ion jets, magnetosheath on the right, magnetosphere on the left. So all four spacecraft saw this. These are the perpendicular crescents, the crescents that are in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. All four of them also saw parallel crescents like these. They look the same. These are not the ones predicted by uh, Michael Hesse. They're not predicted at all. But when we get to the open field lines, these, these are field lines with one foot on the Earth, one foot on the Sun. These turn, the perpendicular crescents either turn into parallel crescents, or parallel crescents are formed, perhaps by parallel electric field. It hasn't been uh, exactly determined how they're formed yet. But this is, um, is what we've seen in this event and in uh, any other, or most of the other events. 
This is the same event for uh, one of the spacecraft, MMS-2. And this shows the uh, S there in the top of the magnetic field plot, stagnation point, X is the X line. This is in LMN coordinates, the boundary normal coordinates, so L is the reconnection field direction, basically north. N is the normal direction, pointing normal out from the magnetopause. And the green is the outer plane direction, that's the M. So you can see the second class electron temperature. It's high on the left, that's the magnetosphere side. It drops off to magnetosphere values. Third panel of electron velocity. This is what carries most of the current that's driving uh, reconnection. The green is the out of plane current. The blue is the L current, basically uh, field aligned. So if you think about the perpendicular crescents, they're carrying this green. Uh, current, which is shown here in terms of electron velocity. This positive VE, perpendicular crescents. The positive uh, VL, the blue line, is the parallel crescents. This are the electron jets. And then the uh, red is the uh, normal direction, which is usually the smallest. Uh, fourth panel is the electric field. So the red one is the V normal. This is the one caused by the uh, uh, penetration of ions across the magnetopause. This is usually the strongest uh, electric field. It has important effects. It is, the what, it is what accelerates the magnesium electrons uh, through the neutral line, uh, through the neutral uh, uh, point into the uh, magnetosphere side. Reconnection electric field is the uh, green one out of plane electric field, and the blue one is parallel to the electric field. So, uh, at the bottom, we can calculate J dot E prime. That's J dot E plus electron velocity cross V. We throw th show three components. It's not a vector, it's a scalar. But you can look at the contributions of the three different, uh, or the currents and electric fields in the three different directions. It's dominated by the out of plane direction M, exactly what's predicted for reconnection. So that's, a, that's the dissipation for reconnection, the green P, the bottom panel. Uh, what's uh, not predicted, although we have seen it in simulations but never addressed it before, is its bipolar nature. If you look to the right of that peak, that green line, the J dot E prime actually goes negative, which is the characteristics of a generator rather than a dissipator. And uh, reconnection as a dissipator, we know. So this has been a mystery. I think we've learned some things about it. Now one thing to, and then on the right is the crescent, the top panel, Perpendicular crescent. The next two are in the plane containing the magnetic field, and the red features you see on those two is just the cut through the perpendicular crescent. There's no parallel crescent at this point, at the stagnation point. If you look at the yellow regions, they're bulged out to the right and left. These are closed field lines. These are the magnetospheric particles. Like in the bottom panel to the left, you can see a small red dot. These are uh, energy, higher energy magnetospheric electrons. So this is closed field lines, reconnection uh, going on. Now one thing to note about this figure, so you want to work on MMS data, you want to find uh, EDRs. Well, all of the EDRs we found, we found exactly the same way. We have a very simple program, makes this plot right here. You look for three things. Look for a magnetic null, where the X is, for out of plane electron velocity in the middle panel, the green one, and you look for crescents. And if you find all those three things, you're guaranteed you have an EDR. Twice I decided to find an EDR. One was a rainy day at EGU. I stayed in my hotel room. Started early at 4 o'clock, I found one. Another time at work, I found one. So uh, you know, it takes, if you want to find one, it's going to take you all day long. But most of the ones we found, 25 out of the 32 on the day side, found by one person, a student who's here, James Webster. So, so you see, you know, that's the future. But anyway, I never catch up with that. So now there was this mystery about this negative J dot E. Uh, you saw it was oscillatory, and I published a paper on it that maybe some people believed. It said it was uh, standing whistler. And it wasn't seen so much in simulations, but Mark Swizdak published this paper. And uh, after that, and we got more electrons, got enough electrons into this 3D simulation 
you can see these same uh, effects. You can see in the upper left panel, the red and blue, that's the uh, J.ID prime, oscillating from positive to negative. Upper right is the electron flow that flowed in along the uh, magnetic sheath size separatrix down near the X line, and this is the E normal, second panel on the left column, that accelerates these electrons through that neutral line region into the uh, magnetosphere side, uh, causing the crescents, causing the dissipation. But when they when they leave that region, see in the upper right panel on the left, you see they start to, there's an eddy type feature there. And this is the way uh, that Swiss Deck interpreted the JRE negative, that the electrons basically flowing upstream in the normal electric field. A lot of work has to be done on this. Now with the guide fields, which so far of what I've shown, I have no guide field. The guide field, uh, published in, uh, there in 2016, an event on December 8, 2015. Guide field is B sub M, so you look in the top panel, the green magnetic field, a trace on the left out of the magnetosheath area, and at uh, minus 20, the uh, <coughs> southward uh, magnetic field out there was similar. So this was a comparable uh, out of plane and in plane magnetic field. So this was a guide field, a moderate guide field. There are stronger ones. This is a moderate one. And there we see the first thing you notice in the bottom, J dot A second panel from the bottom, there's a big peak at X. Where for symmetric, in the previous event I talked about, there was no dissipation there. You look at the stagnation point S, dissipation there also. In between is a quiescent region. This is uh, closed field lines. Everything between stagnation point and X line is closed field lines. So the plasma goes through the X line. Some of the uh, field lines get uh, reconnected. They flow up out of the uh, equatorial plane as open field lines, driving magnetosphere convection. And the other plasma, the other fields that don't reconnect, they must flow around the size of the magnetosphere. The plasma is decoupled and it continues flowing towards the magnetosphere side until it reaches the stagnation point. And during that time, it's accelerated by the uh, normal electric field, and this is why it could flip. Normally, it wouldn't be, it would go around also, but the E normal accelerates this plasma into the stagnation region. So if you look on the uh, right, those distribution functions are just at the X line. Uh, at the stagnation region, we see crescents. At the X line, top panel, perpendicular panel, very, hand, very slight hand of gyrotropy, but not really anything I would call a nice crescent. But in the middle and bottom one are field of line uh, particles. On the left side, you see a, uh, like a beam. At high energy, those are magnetospheric electrons. On the right, you see lower energy in a crescent type distribution. These are the magnetosheath electrons. So this is the uh, out of plane uh, current. You can see it in the out of plane velocity. It's not shown here, but that's uh, what it is. So in this case, the reconnection electric field is E parallel, and the uh, out of plane current is J parallel. And so the, the reason, the way we interpret this is that the guide field gives you a channel for the out of plane current. Very easy for electrons to flow along magnetic fields. And if you have an E parallel in the same direction, a J dot E positive, you get dissipation and reconnection. Stagnation point, you don't have that. There you have uh, no guide fields, so the only way to get the out of plane current is through the crescent distributions. So, to summarize this uh, symmetric on the left, but we'll see in the detail in a few minutes, where the stagnation point and X line are at the same point. We do know now, I'm not showing it, but I don't think it's published yet, and Roshi Asagawa has found that the stagnation point actually has shifted into the tailward exhaust a little bit. That's because when the tail is not completely symmetric. The inflow regions are symmetric, but the outflow are not because on the other side it's going to a strong field and the you know, tail side is going to a weaker field. So even the tail is not completely symmetric, but it's close. But on the side magnetopause, we do have this separation uh, with no guide field. We have uh, an S and an X, but all of the dissipation, the J dot E prime in the middle, bottom panel there is all at S. With a strong guy field, or even a moderate one, we have dissipation at both X uh, and S. So 
This we uh, think we understand. Now there is the generalized Ohm's law, or some people call it an electron momentum equation. Uh, here and it makes some predictions. E plus B cross B, that's the E prime. That's zero, you have MHD, and a lot of exciting things uh, happen with MHD. If you have the uh, final term on the right, A to J, that's, uh, you put that in, you have resistive MHD. And so more exciting things happen. If you have uh, J cross B force, it's important. This is where the ions and electrons become decoupled, and you have currents. And this is whole MHD, and this is another level of complexity. And a lot of this uh, was predicted and known from uh, cluster measurements. And down at the electron scale, there are two other terms here that become important, but you have to make measurements at the electron scale to do this. Uh, first one is electron inertia. Second one is the uh, divergence of the pressure tensor. We can measure all of these things in this equation with the MMS data, and that's because uh, we have the four spacecraft, the uh, FBI makes 30 millisecond electron uh, moments and distribution functions. In fact, another uh, and the rigor is found out and processed the data so that we can actually get 7.5 millisecond resolution on the FPI electron data. So with this, we can measure all of these terms. Problem is, uh, we tried it with the spacecraft separation of 10 kilometers, and it wasn't too uh, definitive. Then we, so we uh, brought that down to 7 kilometers. And there we were getting the space gap. I still don't believe there were all four in the electron diffusion region, but they seemed to be close enough to be able to solve this equation. And so, Kevin uh, Genestretti uh, has published this event, uh, November 28, 2016. I call it my birthday event. Fortunately, he found it, and I did. And so, this was our closest separation 6.4 kilometers. And the top panel, that's the outer plane uh, current, the green one, that's what we're looking for. Second panel is the magnetic field. This is a strong guide field, the green trace there, second panel. And you compare that to the field out in the uh, magnetic sheet, the far right of that panel, and see they're comparable. The guide field is even stronger uh, in the magnetic sheet field. And so in this case, the, you see the third panel, J.E prime, the major peak is at the uh, the X line is determined by where the VL reverses, or near there. And then you see a little blip towards the magnetosphere side to the left of it. That's a stagnation point, but here it's fairly small because this is a very strong guide field. So he went in and compared the divergence of the pressure tensor and the electron inertia. In the bottom, you see the black, uh, black line is data V prime total. Red is from the pressure gradient, pressure tensor divergence. And then the blue dash one is from electron inertia. So in most of the cases we look at, it's the divergence of uh, pressure that's producing the reconnection electric field. But electron inertia does contribute. Here again, we see the bipolar shape of the J dot E prime, as we did with the no gap field case. Now I'll turn to the tail. And uh, we looked quite a bit at this event on uh, July 11th. And uh, so on the left is similar to what we've been looking at. You have a magnetic field. There's an indicator of uh, plasmoid on the left. With those two dash lines, that's the first dash line is before the X line. The second one is right at the X line, as you can tell by looking. The third panel, the blue trace is the electron jet. So in the tail side, you're seeing the, the L direction now is essentially in the X direction, as opposed to Z on the day sign. The M is still the out plane. And the N is in the Z direction now, instead of in the X direction as on the day sign. But third panel, you see electron velocity, electron jet, the blue one, reversing at the X line. Green one is the out of plane current, the one we're looking for. And we find uh, the reconnection events. And then uh, in the fourth panel, one of the things we do is compare uh, the uh, E cross B to the, the uh, electron velocity to see if the electron velocity is E cross B, then it's uh, MHD. Where they deviate, then that 
So not MHD, it might be reconnection. So that's one of the diagnostics we look at. Go down to the fourth from the bottom, the red trace there, reversing at the X line. That's the hollow electric field. And then below that's the J.ID prime. See, it's mostly positive, big positive peak just to the left of the uh, X line. And again, we see the bipolar signature seems to be associated, all of these seem to be associated with moving into the uh, exhaust region, the near part of the exhaust region. The bottom two panels are uh, waves, electric and magnetic, and uh, we see high frequency waves near the plasma frequency, uh, before the X line, after it, see like electrostatic waves, everywhere we're seeing this sort of waves, and so this is another topic I'll cover later. Now, the distribution functions were also predicted here prior to launch, some type, different types of uh, crescents. So there's four of them there, one for the first vertical dash line and one for the second vertical dash line. The top two are in the plane parallel to B, the bottom two are in the plane perpendicular to B. So look at the top ones first, and then on the right there's a simulation by Michael Hassett that there's similar simulations uh, published by Jason Schuster. And they had the uh, best show before launch that showed these kinds of uh, features. On this triangular feature there in the uh, V parallel versus V E cross B direction, look at the upper right panel of distribution functions. You see that triangle. The bottom two, the perpendicular plane, you see multiple crescents on the left one. We haven't seen any multiple crescents on the day side. These seem to only appear in the tail. And we think it's because the particles are able to stay in the layer longer on the back side, where on the base side they're ejected rapidly after one crescent. And on the bottom right one, you see these two small beams, and then the simulation shows these also. I think this is acceleration by the all electric field. Now I've got to speed up. This is the uh, MHD simulation, that's or us, for this event. And see that class might go by? See that X line? Triangle. MMS, plasmoid, x one triangle, okay. This is the all four spacecraft, the parameters magnetic field, current, electric field, J.E for all four spacecraft on top of one another. The green one is MMS3, it goes through first, there's the X line. On the right is a reconstruction performed by Roy Tarver. I think he'll talk about this in his paper tomorrow. And all four spacecraft, but the arrow is showing the electron, big at the plasmoid. Uh, and this from zero to electron jet. So if you look through this again, you'll see the electrons flowing to the uh, left tailward and then uh, flowing earthward. So you can see the electron jet and the magnetic field configuration, including the plasma and the X line, very similar to what was in the uh, MHP simulation. So here's the energetic particles. You see B, the top of that sketch on the right, and in the spectrogram, you see electrons trapped uh, as are going towards the Earth. And in the beam, where it says electrons gentlemen are separated, just at C. So these are much higher energy electrons than there is a, than the uh, reconnection electric field to, could produce. So it's still a mystery of how high energy particles come out of these reconnection regions. But much higher energy that can be explained by the reconnection electric field. So what is the reconnection rate? The simulation people had a canonical rate of 0 0.1 the outfane speed. We knew with MMS we could measure this several different ways. You can measure the ion inflow rate, also electron inflow rate. The outflow rate is uh, always the same. It's the outfane speed and it's in the rest frame of the reconnection structure. You can measure the aspect ratio of the diffusion region. Notice it was longer in L than it is in uh, N, that rectangular box. You can measure the exhaust angle of the outflow, and you can measure the reconduction of the field. Typhon did some of this work with the ion inflow with cluster, got 0.07. Now with MMS, Kevin Genestretti has uh, gone in and realized, I mentioned earlier, E normal is the strongest uh, electric field we have around these regions. EM, the reconduction electric field is usually the weakest. That's the one we want. And so it's difficult to pull that out. And uh, Kevin realized that the boundary normal uh, transformation is key. And so in the bottom right, you see 
all those arrows. And so 14 different uh, transformations that he used. If you got that one, then you had EM was a function of EM. That's the upper left panel, the green and black uh, crosses there. But they are related to one another. Bad transform. So he did find a good transform, the bottom left, where EM and EN are independent. And this shows the reconnection rate. EM, as compared to the inflow electric field, 0.2. Another way to do it, there are two other ways here. Rumi Nakamura has published this. You can see uh, distribution functions on the left, the green one, black one, and purple one. On the right, you see the dash box, it's the diffusion region, so the July 11th event. And this is how the uh, four spacecraft went through it. So you classified these points there as as to whether the, uh, maybe difficult to see, but these are VL, VM distributions. So if you look at the top one, it's pointed a little to the left, the highest energy part of the crescent. And the middle is pointed vertically downward, and on the right is pointed uh, more to the right. So this shows particles in the uh, tailward, coming into the diffusion region from the tailward outflow side, going through the diffusion region and exiting on the uh, earthward outflow side. So we, she could trace the boundaries of that reconnection of the region box and get the aspect ratio, 0.2. Also looked at the electron jet reversal and looked at the electron pressure uh, gradient. And uh, it's kind of complicated, but if you look at the uh, bottom, you see the blue trace and the red trace are close together. That's E and E prime. And they're close to the same as, as H irotropic, as you have near the X Y, H irotropic pressure tensor. And then you have the, uh, when it's near the uh, that solid uh, horizontal bar, then that's a prediction of EM. And so in there, compare EM to the electric field in the inflow region, you got 0 0.18. So everything you do is predicted to be 0 0.1. Most of these are getting to be more like 0.2. Okay, we did do some analysis of high frequency waves in the reconnection region, both on Magnetopos side on the left here, Daniel Graham. You see the electron, uh, the wave spectrogram, the bottom line plot, a line through there's a plasma frequency, and those waves are upper hybrid waves. Bottom left distribution function, the crescent. We did a dispersion analysis, showed that crescent was producing those waves. So in this case, the plasma waves or upper hybrid waves are not <coughs> causing reconnection, but they're a product of it. And uh, I did the same analysis for a tail event on the right. You can see the bottom wave uh, spectrogram. Uh, solid line going through the high frequency waves. In this case, perpendicular crescent, the upper panel on the right is what's shown to be producing these waves. Now, I, I mentioned the ubiquity of reconnection. We have in the shock transition region, presented at this meeting, Shan Long, inside of an FTE published by Marit Arisette, within a Kelvin Helmholtz reconnection event, which is MHD, but inside there, reconnection is going on. And then in the magneto sheath, Rick Wilders published it. Typhon has published a magneto sheath reconnection that's a turbulent sense with no ions uh, involved. And so, just mentioned now in the, ex in the uh, extended mission, we have four campaigns. We have 25 Earth radii apogee. Still goes through the magneto pause. It may be better for the tail. Now we've recently raised the apogee, 29 RE. We just started a, another tail pass. And the second half of this on the dusk side, we should be, are predicted to be very close to the neutral sheet. So we're hoping for more events. So uh, that's it. I think I'll stop there and uh, see if there's any questions. Thank you, Jim. We have time for just a couple of questions. So uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I, I know that LMS doing the amazing good job to study this local uh, dynamics uh, of the connection. But as a, a person who studied the global phenomena, I often feel lost. 
And uh, what I want to know is uh, how often the connection happens. Whenever passing the uh, whenever MMS passing the daylight region, do you see the reconnection? And where often do you see the reconnection? Is there really anti-parallel reconnection zone or the component reconnection zone? Yeah, yeah. Would you answer that? Well, I'm not sure any thousands or many Yeah, maybe. So maybe some other revision. 9,000 million across across six. We had the EDR 35 times, okay, even though the X line is highly extended. I think reconnection is going on all the time, or else the land use here wouldn't be convecting. But it's always going on somewhere. So MMS can't answer that. We were just lucky to be able to analyze what's going on in the, in the events that we encountered. What we need to do is something like cross scale, where you have tetrahedron like MMS, and you have some more tetrahedrons, like the ion scale, or MHD scale, like global scale, then you might be able to do what you're interested in. Yeah, Thank you. So those of us that study ionospheric output often cite heavy ion effects on reconnection of the magnetosphere as a motivation for studying that problem. Has MMS seen reconnection events with large amounts of ionospheric oak plus or other heavy ions, and, and do they really matter? Yes, there are some published papers on uh, cold ions from the plasma sphere plume coming into the EDR. We have others from the uh, higher energy part, uh, heavy ions coming in. Uh, nothing to oh. tell There's a paper that says there's no effect, the paper that has a small effect. I think it's a small effect. Usually you think about the alphane speed being slowed down by these heavy ion loading. Uh, so the prediction would be it would slow it down, but it's not definitive. There are papers coming out on a regular basis. Uh, Sergio Toledo Redondo had one just recently on plasma ones, so you should look for that. Okay, thank you very much, James. Well, okay. <laughs>